Hi everybody, in this video I'm going to be going over test number five. So question number one says which statement is not always true about parallelograms. So if we go from the bottom up in a parallelogram, the opposite sides are always parallel. That's the definition of a parallelogram. Both pairs of opposite sides are parallel. So that is always true. So I'm going to cross that one out. The opposite angles are congruent. That is a property of parallelograms. We know that if we do have a parallelogram, both pairs of opposite angles are congruent to each other. Since it's true, I'm going to eliminate it. The opposite sides are congruent. That is a property of parallelograms. We know that if we have a parallelogram, both pairs of opposite sides are congruent. Since it's true, I'm gonna get rid of it. The diagonals are congruent. Not every parallelogram has congruent diagonals, specifically a rectangle has congruent diagonals. That's gonna be our answer because it's not always true. It's only true about specific kinds of parallelograms that also satisfy the property of rectangles. Question number two says parallelogram ABCD with diagonals AC and BD intersecting at E. And it says which statement must be true. So first, let me think about what I know about the diagonals of a parallelogram. Well, the only thing I really know is that the diagonals bisect each other. So let me put that in and let me see if that helps me answer the question. Question number one says that BE is congruent to CE. I don't know that's true unless I know that the diagonals are congruent to each other, then each of the halves would be the same. But I don't know that that's true. It's a parallelogram, it's not a rectangle. So I cannot assume that. I know that BE and ED are congruent and that AE and EC are congruent, but I have no way of knowing from the information here if BE and EC are congruent to each other. So I have to assume that they're not. Angle BAE, so where's that angle? That's right over here, angle BAE, congruent to angle DCE. Well, I know that opposite sides in a parallelogram are parallel to each other. And if I just highlight my parallel lines for a second and my transversal AC that's intersecting them, I do see my backwards letter Z. And in the corners of the letter Z, we do have our alternate interior angles, which are congruent because we do know that the lines forming them are parallel since this is a parallelogram. So I would say that is true. Alternate interior angles are always congruent as long as we have parallel lines making them, which we do here. Just to talk about the other choices, AB and BC, those are two consecutive sides of this parallelogram. I don't know that they're congruent unless this is a rhombus because then consecutive sides would be congruent, making it equilateral. But a regular parallelogram does not have to be equilateral, does not have to have congruent consecutive sides. And finally, angle DAE, so angle DAE, I'm going to put that in blue, congruent to angle CBE. Well, these are not alternate interior angles. In fact, they are two they're they look to be corresponding angles one angle in triangle adc and one angle in triangle bdc so if i wanted to show that they were congruent to each other i would first need to prove triangle adc and triangle bcd congruent to each other um it doesn't appear that we have the information for that here if you mark your diagram we would have a side from the opposite sides being congruent of a parallelogram. And we would also have a shared side due to the reflexive property. And that's all that we would have. So we wouldn't have enough information to prove triangle ADC and triangle BDC congruent. So we wouldn't be able to say that these angles were for sure congruent by CPCDC. So I'm going to cross that choice out as well. Okay, next question. In parallelogram JKLM, let me draw that out. Here's parallelogram JKLM. It is a parallelogram. So the measure of angle L exceeds the measure of angle M by 30 degrees. So whatever angle M is, angle L is 30 more than that because it exceeds it by 30 degrees. And we need to find the measurement of angle J. So 
First, let's find what x is. I know that in a parallelogram, consecutive angles are supplementary, meaning that they add to 180. So x plus x plus 30 equals to 180 degrees. That's 2x plus 30 equals to 180. That's 2x is equal to 150. x is equal to 75. So a lot of people were picking answer choice number one but the question's asking for angle J. So we do need to substitute back in. X represents angle M, but if I just substitute in for angle L here, 75 plus 30 is 105. And we know that opposite angles in a parallelogram are congruent, making the correct answer, answer choice two. Angle J would also be 105 degrees. Question number four is talking about isosceles trapezoid ABCD. Let me take a second and really quickly draw that out, ABCD. And it's telling me that it has diagonals AC and BD. And if we know that diagonal AC, so the whole diagonal here is 5x plus 13, and the whole diagonal BD, is 11x minus 5, we need to find the value of x. So in an isosceles trapezoid, one of the properties is that diagonals are congruent to each other. So I know that the whole diagonal AC should equal to the whole diagonal BD. So I can make an equation. 5x plus 13 is equal to 11x minus 5. Adding 5 to both sides, I have 5x plus 18 equals to 11x, subtracting 5x on both sides, 18 is equal to 6x, and dividing by 6 on both sides, x is equal to 3. And the question is just asking us for the value of x, so that would be the correct answer here. Question number 5 says, if the diagonals of a quadrilateral do not bisect each other, then the quadrilateral could be so diagonals bisecting each other is a property of a parallelogram. So that's going to apply to a parallelogram and to any of the other quadrilaterals that start as parallelograms, which are all of them except for trapezoid. Remember, rectangle, rhombuses, and squares all have to start out as parallelograms. So if this property of parallelograms does not apply, then the only option here that would make sense is trapezoid because it's not a parallelogram, so it doesn't automatically have the properties of parallelograms, such as diagonals bisecting each other. Number six. In the diagram below of rectangle RSTU, diagonals RT and SU intersect at O. So they tell us that RT, so that's the whole diagonal here, is 6x plus 4, and SO, so SO is just part of this diagonal, it's 7x minus 6. Remember that um, rectangles have all the properties of parallelograms, they start as parallelograms, so the diagonals do bisect each other. So if SO is 7x minus 6, the other half, OU, is also going to be 7x minus 6. Remember that in a rectangle, the diagonals are also congruent to each other. So the whole diagonal RT is going to be equal to the whole diagonal US. So the whole diagonal RT is 6x plus 4. And that should be equal to the whole diagonal US. The whole diagonal US is this half plus this half. The top half here, UO, is 7x minus 6 plus the bottom half, SO which is also 7x minus 6. Let's combine our like terms and solve for x really quickly. So we have 14x minus 12 over here. 6x plus 16 equals to 14x. Let me subtract 6x on both sides. 16 is equal to 8x. And finally, let me divide by 8 on both sides, and I get eight is x is equal to 2. So the question didn't ask for the x value. It asked for the length of us, 
which is one of the whole diagonals of this rectangle. So the diagonals are congruent, so you can substitute in for either diagonal and just write down what it is. Um, since it's talking about us, I'll just substitute into 7x minus 6, and then I'll multiply it by 2 or add it to itself because two halves make a whole, and each half is 7x minus 6. So 7 times 2 is 14, minus 6 is 8, and if there's... If this is 8 over here, then this is also 8. 8 plus 8 is 16. So I'm going to write here the length of US is 16. Okay, number 7. Okay, let's take a look at question number 7. So a lot of information here. Um, the first piece of information is that this whole quadrilateral star is a rhombus, and that's going to be really important to us. And without reading everything, because it's already marked in the diagram for us, we're basically finding SR, RT, and angle TAS. So I'm going to start with SR, because it's the first one written. So SR is right over here. It's a side of the rhombus. And I know something about the sides of a rhombus. I know that they're all equal. A rhombus is equilateral. So I know that this side of the rhombus I'm trying to find should be equal to any of the other three sides of the rhombus. And we just happen to know this one. So I can make an equation that says SR, one side of the rhombus, which is 8x minus 5, is equal to ST, this other side of the rhombus, because all sides of a rhombus are equal to each other. Solving my equation, let me subtract 3x, that's 5x, and let me add Five to both sides is equal to 65. And if I divide by five on both sides, I get x is equal to seven. Okay, so let me plug back in for SR in order to find what SR is. So that's eight times x, which is seven, minus five. And that gives us 56 minus 5, which is 51. So SR is equal to 51. So we've done enough. We've done less than that. Let's move on to the next one. Let's find RT. So RT represents this whole diagonal over here. But the only thing I know about this diagonal is that, because a rhombus has all the properties of a parallelogram, is that diagonals bisect each other. So I know that this half and this half are equal. So if this half is 5z plus 5, this half is also going to be 5z plus 5. But that's not going to help me solve for z, because if I make an equation that says 5z plus 5 is equal to 5z plus 5, and a lot of people did that on the test, you'll find that you get infinite solutions. You'll get zero equals to zero, which if you remember from algebra one means infinite solutions. It makes sense because you're setting something that's exactly the same as each other equal to each other. So of course, it's always going to be true no matter what. Um, but it's not really going to give us that value of Z that we're looking for because the Z is going to drop out and you're going to get infinite solutions. So instead, we can use what we know about the other diagonal to find Z. And then once we have z, we can plug in and find the length of rt. So remember, in a parallelogram, as well as in a rhombus, diagonals bisect each other. So this half of this diagonal is equal to this half of this diagonal, just like this half of this diagonal was equal to this half of this diagonal. So I can make an equation to solve for z. I can say on diagonal sa, this half, 3z is equal to this other half, 4z minus 8. Let me make that look more like a 4 because it doesn't right now. Okay. Um, let's solve this equation. I'm going to add 8 to both sides and subtract 3z from both sides. So I get 8 is equal to z. And from there, all I'm going to do is take my z value and plug in to find the length of RT. So I'm going to plug in to 5z plus 5. And once I get that, I'll know what the other half is. I can add the two halves together to get the whole diagonal. So 
5z plus 5, so that's 5 times 8 plus 5. So that's 40 plus 5, which is equal to 45. So one half of the diagonal is 45. The other half is also 45. 45 plus 45 is 90. So the whole RT has a length of 90. There we go. And finally, the measure of angle TAS. TAS. So we're looking for this angle over here, the one represented as 9y plus 8. So if I just take a look really quickly, that's one of the angles in this triangle over here. Um, I know in a rhombus that the diagonals are perpendicular to each other. That means where the diagonals meet, they form 90 degree angles. So the diagonals, both of them meet right here at this point E. So that means at point E, we have a 90 degree angle here. We have a 90 degree angle here, one here, and one here. So I know that in this triangle TEA that I just highlighted in purple, there's three angles in the triangle. One of them is 9y plus 8. The other one is 5y minus 2. And the last one is 90 degrees because the diagonals are perpendicular to each other. Now I can make an equation that says if I add all three angles of the triangle together, I should get 180 degrees. Let me do that one up here to give myself some more space. So 5y minus 2 plus 9y plus 8 plus 90 is equal to 180 degrees. Let's combine some like terms. That's 14y. And let me add 90 plus 8. That's 98. And I'll subtract 2. That's 96 equals to 180. Let's subtract 96 from both sides. We get 84. And then finally, dividing both sides by 14, we get y is equal to 6. And now I'm just going to plug in to find the measurement of angle TAS, which is what we're looking for. That's 9y plus 8. So that's 9 times our y value of 6 plus 8. So let me put that into my calculator. That's 54 plus 8 which is 62. I'll write 62 degrees because that is an angle measurement that we just found. And there we have it. We finished number seven. Okay, number eight. So there's many different ways to write a coordinate geometry proof, but the number one thing a lot of people were doing is we're writing a two column statement reason chart, and I'm not really sure why. Because we can clearly see in the question that we're given coordinates to work with. We have a grid here. Um, we even got graph paper on the test because the grid didn't print very well. So we know we're writing a coordinate geometry proof here. We know coordinate geometry proofs use formulas and calculations in order to prove what we're trying to prove. So let me just take a second and graph my quadrilateral. I'm going to pause the video while I... Okay, so I gra graphed my quadrilateral and I need to prove that it's a parallelogram but is neither a rhombus nor a rectangle. So I guess I will use the distance formula. I know a lot of people like slope, but I'll start off by using the distance formula to prove that we have a parallelogram because if I use the distance formula, it's just gonna make my life a little bit easier with the rhombus part. But if you use slope formula, it'll make your life a little bit easier with the rectangle part. So it's totally up to you. I'm just picking a way to do it. But as long as you show that you have a parallelogram, then show that you don't have a rhombus and that you don't have a rectangle, then you're all good to go. So I'm going to pause the video for a second so I can do my distance formula so you're not watching for a really long time. And then I will unpause it when I am done. So I have over here my calculations for the distance formula. Notice I did the distance formula four times, one for each of the sides of the quadrilateral. And I was able to see that AB and DC both have the same length of 11 and AD and BC both have the same length of radical 85. So I put a concluding statement um, explaining what my calculation showed. So ABCD is a parallelogram because both pairs of opposite sides are congruent. Doing the distance formula for all the sides also allowed me to prove that it's not a rhombus.
because in order to be a rhombus, it needs to be a parallelogram with congruent consecutive sides. In other words, a parallelogram that is equilateral, that all the sides are equal. Um, but I can clearly see from the lengths I found with the distance formula that only the opposite sides have the same length are congruent and the sides next to each other don't. So all the sides are not the same. It's not a rhombus. So I wrote over here, ABCD is not a rhombus because consecutive sides are not congruent. To show it's a rectangle, you can either find the slopes of each of the sides and show that you don't have negative reciprocals. That means no right angle. Remember, in order to be a rectangle, you got to have at least one right angle in your parallelogram. And in fact, if you have one right angle in your parallelogram, that means they're all right angles. So to show a rectangle, you just got to show your parallelogram also has a right angle. But I don't really want to do four more slopes, and I've been doing the distance formula anyway. So I think I'm just going to show that diagonals are congruent, which is another property of a rectangle, which would make it a rectangle if the diagonals are congruent, and would show that it's not a rectangle if the diagonals are not congruent. So let me pause the video and I'm just going to find the length of diagonal AC and the length of diagonal BD so we can see if this is a rectangle. And I have a feeling it's not going to be because the question tells us to show that this is not a rectangle. Okay, so I used the distance formula and I found the length of diagonal AC and BD and I found that they were not the same. So I have here ABCD is not a rectangle because the diagonals are not congruent to each other. Okay, for number nine over here, we're going to be writing a proof. And we know that PROE, the quadrilateral in the diagram, is a rhombus. So remember, rhombuses have all the properties of a parallelogram, um, plus they're equilateral. And they don't. we don't have any diagonals here. We don't have ER or PO drawn in. There's no diagonals here. So we're not going to need any properties of the diagonals of rhombuses. And they also tell us in the givens that SPR, right over here, oops, let me draw that a bit better, SPR is congruent to VOR. And our goal is to prove SE congruent to EV. So SE is a side of this triangle over here, and EV is a side of this triangle over here. So in order to prove SE congruent to EV, what we need to do is prove the two triangles congruent. And once we prove the two triangles congruent, then we can say that SE is congruent to EV by CPCTC. So the first thing I'm noticing is that in my two triangles, I have vertical angles. So angles are always congruent. That gives me something to work with here. Great. I also know that PROE is a rhombus, so I know that all the sides are equal. So this side and this side are equal to each other. So already I have a pair of angles and a pair of sides in the two triangles. Remember, givens are there for a reason, and if something's given to you, it's probably going to be used in some way or another. So this given over here that angle SPR and angle VOR are congruent is probably going to be used for a reason. And the reason is we're going to use the information about this angle and this angle to get the piece of the angle inside of the triangles that we're interested in. So since we have angles that are larger than the angles in the triangles that we want, we're going to be using the subtraction postulate to make the information that we have smaller. So we're left over with just the angles inside of the yellow and the purple triangles that we're interested in. So in order to do that, we are going to have to subtract off this part of the green angle so that we're left over with the part inside the triangle. And we're going to have to subtract off this part of this green angle so we're left over with the part that's inside the triangle. We're able to do this because we know that angle SPR and angle VOR are congruent from the givens. And since we have a rhombus, we know that opposite angles are congruent to each other. So we know that these two angles in blue, EOR and EPR, are congruent, so we can subtract them so that we're left over with just the angles that we need. I'll mark them in red inside of the two triangles. Then we have the triangles congruent by ASA. And then we can say that SE is congruent to EV by CPCTC once we know the triangles are already congruent. 
I'm going to pause the video for a second and I'm going to just write up this proof so you can see it written out. So here I have the proof um, completely written out in as few steps possible, which is eight steps I have here. So um, I wrote it out in a slightly different order than I said it out loud before. So I just started off with the subtraction of the angles just to get that out of the way. So from our givens, we had the green angle SPR and the green angle over here VOR congruent to each other. We want to use subtraction to be left over with just the part of the angle that's inside the two triangles. That's the two red angles over here. So in order to do the subtraction, I need to know that the part of the angle that we're going to be subtracting away that I have marked in blue are congruent to each other. Because remember to use subtraction, we have to start with congruent and also be subtracting congruent. So I made the statement in step number two that these two blue angles, EOR and EPR, are congruent because they are opposite angles in a rhombus. And we know that opposite angles in a rhombus are congruent since they have all the properties of parallelograms. Then we can do our subtraction. We can take angle SPR, the green angle, subtract off EPR, the blue part, and that leaves us over with SPE, the part inside the triangle um, that's in red, which you can see here in step number four. Over here, we're starting off with angle VOR. We're subtracting off the part in blue that we don't need that's outside the triangle, that's angle EOR. And we're being left over with the part in red that's inside the triangle that we're interested in, which is angle VOE, as you can see from step number four. Then I also made sure to include anything else I marked in the diagram to prove the two triangles congruent, like sides EP and EO. I definitely needed to say they were congruent because all sides of a rhombus are congruent. And I marked my vertical angles in my diagram, so I needed to make sure in step number six that I got that into my proof. Vertical angles are always congruent. And now I have all the information in my proof that I need for ASA, ASA. And after that, it's one more step to say that SE and EV are congruent by CPCTC. After you prove triangles congruent, the corresponding sides are also congruent by CPCTC. Okay, let's take a look at this proof over here. This is the last question on the test. So ABCD is a square, and they also tell us from our givens that AE is congruent to AF. And the first thing that we need to prove is the two triangles BAF and DAE are congruent to each other. So already from our givens, we have a pair of congruent sides. Um, once again, I see vertical angles, and those are really nice because we know vertical angles are always congruent no matter what. And I know that the quadrilateral here, BADC, is a square. Sorry, ABCD, I should call it, is a square. I know all the sides are equal. So I know that the side and the side are equal to each other. So I already see that the triangles are congruent by SAS. There we go. That's part A. All done. For part B, that's where it gets a little bit trickier. We need to show that angle CBF, so that's this whole angle over here, is congruent to angle CDE. That's this whole angle over here. Well, now that we know the triangles are congruent to each other, we know that this angle and this angle are congruent to each other by CPCTC. Remember, after we prove triangles congruent, any of the sides or angles in the same spot, any of the corresponding sides or angles are also congruent by CPCTC. So I can say that these two angles are definitely congruent by CPCTC because we know the triangles themselves are congruent by SAS. And since I have a square here, I know that squares have four congruent angles, right? They're all right angles, just like a rectangle. Squares have all the properties of rectangles. So I know that this angle over here is a 90 degree right angle, and so is this angle over here. So since I know that the two purple angles are congruent, and I know that the two blue right angles are congruent, I can add them together to get the whole angle CBF congruent to the whole angle CDE. Notice if you add the purple and the blue, you get the whole angle CBF. And if you add the purple and the blue over here, you get the whole angle CDE. The addition process. So let me pause a second so I can write up this proof and then I will show you guys the proof. So here I have the proof written out in as few steps as possible, which turned out to be eight steps, just like the last one. So first I mentioned all the things necessary to prove the two triangles congruent for part A. 
So from our givens, we already had side AF and side AE. And then I made sure in step number two to mention my vertical angles that I'm using. And in step number three, I mentioned the two other sides that I'm using, BA and DA. And once again, I knew that BA and DA were congruent because they're sides of the square. And I know that all sides of a square are congruent to each other. That gives me SAS, SAS. So my next step is to say that the two triangles are congruent by SAS. And that's part A. Then I'm going to go into proving that angle CBF, this whole angle in black over here, is congruent to angle CDE, this whole angle in black over here. Since we just proved the two triangles are congruent, I know that the two purple angles are also congruent by CPCTC. The two purple angles are both in like the top corner of the two triangles. They're in the same position, the same spot of the two triangles. So since the triangles are congruent, those angles in the same position, those corresponding angles are also congruent by CPCTC. That's my step number five. Angle FBA right over here is congruent to angle EDA right over here, the two purple angles. And I also know that the angle right next to it, angle CBA, is a right angle. And the angle right next to this purple angle over here, angle CDA, is also a right angle. And that's because a square has four congruent right angles. So all four angles in a square are right angles. So now I know that the two purple angles are congruent from step number five. And I know that the two blue angles are congruent right angles from step number six. So since I have two congruent pieces, I can combine them together. And the purple angle plus the blue angle gives me the whole black angle, which is angle CBF. And the purple angle and the blue angle over here gives me the whole black angle, which is angle CDE. So through the addition postulate, we have, and then through substitution, we have that angle CBF is congruent to angle CDE, which is what we're looking for. And that's it.